We're going to begin in Matthew chapter 7 um, in Sunday school. Uh, we talked about this week the reality that God is not only going to judge us for the fruit that we should be bearing right now, but if we're not growing, He's also going to judge us for the fruit that we could have borne for Him. And that's, uh, that's a pretty sobering fact. I'd never thought of that before Sunday morning, preaching that Sunday school where the, the man said, Lord, I, what you gave me, I just kept in a napkin. You know, I hid it, which is the idea that he didn't want to work with what the Lord had given him in his life. And he, he just sort of squandered it, you know, squatted on it, for lack of better words, and just said, I'm just going to be a squatter here. I'm not really going to earn my keep or, you know, room and board, if you would. Um, and ultimately, uh, God came and took it from that one who didn't do anything with it and gave it to the one who was faithful and did much with what the Lord had given him. But his response to the Lord was, I knew that you came after and required in areas that, you know, weren't even there yet. In other words, uh, you know, even a business should grow. And so Christians should grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus God doesn't expect a first-year sapling to bear fruit, a lot of fruit, and God doesn't expect either a 40-year tree or a 25-year-old tree in the Lord to not bear any fruit in the areas that they should have matured by that. So we need to really be understanding of that. And there's a lot in the Bible about that. The Bible talks about, you know, what was done to the fig tree that didn't bear any fruit. The man said, you know, cut it down, it cumbereth the ground, in other words, just taking up space. God said, no, the Lord, the the Husbandmen said, no, 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 wait a minute. Let's let's give it some chance. Let's dung it. Let's fertilize it. And then we'll see if it bears fruit. Let's give it an opportunity. And if we think about our life, you know, God does the same thing. He gives us all kinds of retests, all kinds of retrials, all kinds of uh, new ways to, to learn. Um, and I, I was uh, reading tonight, you know, we call it retest. But have you ever gotten a, a place in your life where you just do something all over again? And you're there again. You're like, oh, this seems familiar, Lord. It feels like you've brought me to this place in my life before, and I think you want me to pass this time. Almost like deja vu moments, if you would. God doesn't say, you failed. That's it. I'm done with you. And the reason I'm bringing that in here tonight is because I want to talk about our stand for the Lord. Our stand for the Lord. And often the world calls on us to, I should say the Lord calls on us to stand. And He wants us to be a Christian, not just in what we say, but in what we do. And we've talked about uh, the steps of a good man, how God orders our steps, and we take care to make sure we're walking in the right direction. We've also talked about our standards. You remember the other week here on Wednesday night, we talked about how important it is that we as Christians have standards. And our standards are not to be the world's standards, and the world's standards are not to be our standards. And as the world gets more evil, we're not to be where the world once was, but we're still to be a Christian. The Bible says, learn not the way of the heathen. Our standard will always be different from the world. So this week, I want to talk about our stand because uh, we need certainly to stand for the Lord. Matthew chapter 7, let's get into it here and we'll read a lot. Matthew chapter 7. And uh, let's see here what the Lord speaks to us tonight about. I certainly pray that He will speak to your heart and help you as he is trying to help me, this hard-headed man that I am. Amen. Our stand, Matthew chapter 7. Well, first of all, if we're going to talk about our first, uh, what is it going to take for us to stand? We're going to first need to find something stable, something solid. I want to talk about our stability. Point number one, if you're going to take a stand for the Lord, you've got to be stable. All right. First thing I thought of, Um, was the reality of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7. Do you ever wonder why someone one day is living for the Lord and not the next day? Ever wonder why someone this week has a real zeal for something and next week they don't? Well, Matthew chapter 7, the Bible says here in the story of God's words. Look at verse 24. Therefore, he said, Matthew 7, 24, Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, heareth these sayings of mine, what is he saying? He's saying his word. Who, who hears God's word and does something with it? And he says here, and doeth them. I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. 
And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Now this is so simple, and yet so serious in our faith. If we're going to stand for the Lord and His Word, we have to obey it. it. It's really, you know, no Christian who's living in sin, when sin is presented in front of them, and it's their opportunity to stand against it, if their life is living in a, in a, in a matter of not walking with God, but, but sitting in the seat of the scornful, as the Bible says, and you're walking in sin unto sin, iniquity unto iniquity, well, it's really hard to speak evil against sin. The Bible says we're to hate evil, and love righteousness. That's the attribute of a believer. And the Bible says, woe unto them that call good evil and evil good. So if we are living a deceitful life by sin, and we're saying it's no real big deal what sin is doing in my life, it's okay, it's, it's, you know, it's not the best, but it's not really evil. Well, then we're deceiving ourselves, and we won't be able to recognize when the opportunity comes for us to stand against sin because we're in it. <laughs> Hello? No wonder the devil works so hard to get at us in our life to fall in some area, no matter if it's here, if it's here, if it's here, it's here. It doesn't matter because or where we're at, anywhere he can get us because then when the opportunity comes that we can stand, well, we're not able because we're in the wrong place with the Lord. And um, so it's really simple to say that. Um, and the Bible's full of that. You know, if you've read through the Old Testament, the Bible says those prophets, they couldn't speak for the Lord because... God wasn't with them because they were obviously, if you read their life, he's constantly calling them out because of how they're living and who they are, and they're not what they need to be in the Lord. And therefore, they, they actually were not used of God to take a stand, as the Bible says, to uh, separate between the clean and unclean and to separate between the profane and the common or the holy and the profane. And the reason for that is simply because they had not set that standard in their life. So therefore, they couldn't take a stand against it by preaching. And, and I'd like to say this. You, you can't, there's, a, there's the idea here of light and, and, and heavy, if you would. You know, how many times, go, go back with me here. Oh, we, we haven't finished this, I apologize. I'm preaching too fast, too much, too quick. So let's slow down just for a minute. It says, Verse 24, Jesus says, If we hear and do the sayings, we'll be likened unto a man which built his house upon a rock, and that man is wise. Now, verse 25, The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, and beat upon that house, what? And it fell not. What? It stood. You get it? It stood. And it says, um, Why? For it was founded upon a rock. So if we are going to be able to stand for the Lord, we have to be upon the firm rock. We have to be standing uh, upon God and His Word, which means we have to be found in it. Okay, you can't. Sometimes we skirt around it and we say, well, I see what's right. I, I know what's right, but that doesn't mean we are where we need to be, which is right with the Lord. And that is a deceitful thing of the heart. You can say, well, I know what's right, but just that's not the same as being right with the Lord. Well, you know, I can see what's right. I know what I need to do there, Lord. But that doesn't mean you are right with the Lord and doing what is right with the Lord. That's, and and I, I warn you of that because I know I'm guilty of it in my life. Um, so what does it say? Verse 26, though. Everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be like unto a foolish man which built his house upon the unstable, the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So the idea here is that the stand is not possible unless we have stability, and you can't have stability unless you're upon something solid, and of course we know the Bible is the rock of God's Word, and Jesus Christ being the same according to the Word of God. He is our sure uh, confidence. So, and, and of course, something else here is sound doctrine. We can't base our life on what a person teaches us. This Sunday morning, I will be making a correction in my message that I preached last Sunday morning on the doctrine of Dan. I made a mistake and preached something that was not biblical. And my wife, she's making a CD right now. And she sent me a text message on the doctrine of Dan saying I'm making a new CD. And I went, stop. I have to make an amendment to that. I was wrong about something. I have to go back and add a little bit to that. And she said, you got three minutes. I said, I can fit it in there. We'll put it on the CD. So come Sunday morning and find out what I preached wrong last Sunday morning. And uh, I didn't have it all together. And what's amazing by this is I got talking to another preacher on the phone on the way to church tonight or sometime today. 
And he said, I started talking to him, telling him about how I had made the wrong, I preached the wrong thing on the doctrine of Dan. There was something I, I very wrong about. And he said, well, what do you know? I thought the same thing you did. And I thought, well, brother, we both know our Bible. We've been reading it, and somehow we both missed that. And so um, the reality is, if you just take every word that a preacher says and believe every word a preacher says, you're going to be in a mess. And uh, I'm not ashamed to say I was wrong and that I'm capable of preaching something wrong out of the Bible. So that's why I admonish you as believers, continue to not build your faith on the sand, but on the rock. Amen. Not the man, but the man, Christ Jesus, the rock and his word. Okay. And um, that's why I think a lot of times when preachers leave, you know, what did you come to the church for? Did you come to hear God's word or did you come to hear that man? And, um, you know, that's that's I think sometimes we're a little bit too much of followers of man instead of followers of this book. Um, if we're believing this is God's house, it should matter not who stands in this pulpit, but as long as it's the one that God chose and as long as they're out of this book that God chose to teach us from. So um, putting that in our minds, we, we need to understand that we don't want to make a false balance. Let's go to Proverbs here. Um, a false balance. Now, this, of course, is talking about uh, the fact when people would weigh things, you know, like how you, you know how it is when you go there to the um, uh, giant food stores, you're getting your oranges, you're getting your tomatoes that are six, $6.78 a pound, you know, and it's, it's pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy. I, I heard people talking about it the other day, you know, and um, we need to be careful. Uh, Proverbs here, uh, what is today's date? Okay, chapter 11, I read yesterday. False balance. Look at this, chapter 11. Thank you. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 1. I read this yesterday and I thought, hmm, that's good. So if we went to, to Giant, we'd be pretty upset if, you know, it was a one pound tomato and it rung up two pounds. I mean, everybody would. But when it comes to the things of God, we can't say that, you know, good isn't really that big of a deal and evil isn't that big of a deal. In other words, don't let us have the idea or mindset that, well, a little bit of sin isn't no big deal. One preacher said, oh God, if there be anything, let not the small sins destroy my life. Because Christians think it's just the small things, but really that's the big things because that's where Satan's entered into your life to do his work. So, you know, we say, well, I mean, yeah, I know I could do good, but it's not really that important. How often in the Old Testament did you hear the phrase, the burden of the Lord? Remember that phrase? And there were the others that would say, oh, the burden of the Lord. And God said, don't you say that. Why? How is that? Because the reality was some people were missing the point of the things that mattered to God, which was a bur should be a burden to us. It should bother us. We should stand for what's right. And then other people were making a big deal out of things that God was not making a big deal out of. And he said, don't you say that because that doesn't matter to me. This is what really matters to me. And we have the same thing today. We don't want to have a false balance in the sense of uh, we don't want to make light of the things that are a big deal with God when we make a stand for something. And then on the other hand, we don't want to make a big stand over something that's not a really big deal when it comes to Christianity. And you see that. You see the error in both. We make big deals out of small things sometimes as Christians. And the ones that should be great matters that cause great destruction and great uh, you know, harm to the body and, and to, uh, uh, to the Christian life and the Christians are asked, we're like, oh, it's no big deal. Oh, well, we should have a, a right balance there. In other words, if God says it's a big deal, we should see it as a big deal. If God says it's not a major thing, it should be a minor thing, then that's how we should treat it. And sometimes people get that false balance in that sense. They don't have the same just weight as God says. Here it says a just weight is his delight. And, of course, how do we understand that? Well, by the Bible. That's how we know um, really what matters. Psalm 40, the Bible says that God brought us up out of a miry pit and He set our feet upon the rock. Amen? And so that's the first thing. We need solid, stable ground if we're going to take a stand for the Lord. Amen? We need solid, stable ground. If you're counting on man's words to hold you up, uh, you're surely going to be blown over by the winds. And uh, the sand, because what happens is when the waters come crashing of life, the raging storms of life, the sand goes away. 
but the rock stays. And that's very important for us as Christians to glean tonight from this message is that I need God's word in my life. I need God's promises. If I'm going to stand for the Lord, I need to, to do them. I need to obey them. And then I'll be able to stand upon them uh, for the Lord. Number two, here's something pretty interesting. Not only does the ground have to be solid and stable, the rock of God and his word, but it also, believe it or not, if you don't want to get knocked over and you want to stand for the Lord, your stance has a lot to do with it. Now think about this tonight. Your stance has a lot to do with your stability. Your stance. You know, uh, we certainly, uh, Justice, come on up here. Everybody's falling asleep. I need an example. Come on. Come here, Joe. Come on up here. Come on up here. Jason, come on up here. Three examples. All right. So I got... You're going to be my first one. I want you to cross your legs. Just like uh, wrap one leg all the way around as much as you can. All right, there you go. Okay. So there's my first guy. He's all mixed up. He don't know what's right. He's just a mess as a Christian. But he's trying to stand on that rock. I like to say this too. This is what unbelief looks like. Unbelief is, well, yeah, Lord, I know I'm standing on your promises, but I'm not really sure if I can count on them. That's, that's lack of faith right there. Okay. All right, number two, uh, Joe, I need you to stand real close, put your feet together. All right, okay. The second, the second one here says, I believe God, I know His promises to be true, but I'm not willing to walk forward with the things that God is showing me from day to day. So it's a lack of obedience, all right? Now, you have to bear with me. We're going to pause time here for a minute, okay, with Jason. A person who is walking never has his feet together. You agree? If I walk right down this aisle, my feet are never together. This is profound. I just hit this. It, I love seeing something fresh when I study the Bible. So, Jason, let's put you right in the middle of a walk. Like, let's start back there, if you would. And I'm, I'm going to grab a hold of you. And when I grab a hold of you, you've got to stop, okay? And I don't want you to take another step. All right, right there. Now. Fellow number one, all mixed up, not really believing, not really trusting God. Time to take a stand for the Lord. He's done. Fellow number two, believes God but disobeys Him, does not want to walk with the Lord, and he's standing still. Very easy to knock over. Fellow number three, walking with God, obedient to the Lord. Opportunity comes to his life. God says, stop and take a stand. A lot more stable. You all with me? All right, thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate your help tonight. So our stance is important, right? Your stance. You don't, don't live a life of unbelief. The Bible says they, they entered not in because of unbelief. One foot in front of the other. I mean, you know, a boxer, a karate guy, it don't matter what involved you're in, your foot, one foot behind the other is the best stance even for war. Nobody goes to war like this. Nobody goes to war like this. And interesting enough, go to Psalm number one. I'm going to show you something here. When you're sitting, it don't take much to knock you down at all because you're already knocked down. Whether you realize that. And, you know, we rest in the Lord. There's no doubt about that. We sit at His table. We understand that. But the Bible talks about the reality of what happens in the life of a Christian when they walk in the wrong way. You know, Satan knows if he can get us not to walk with the Lord, well, then eventually we will come to the point in our life where we're not only not able to stand for the Lord, but we're actually in a place of scorn, a seat of the scornful, the Bible calls it, which means we've went the wrong way, we're hanging out with sinners, and before you know it, we're one of them, and there's nothing we can do. We're all seated at the same table. That's why Lot sat there and called all of his men in the same city brethren. You know why? Because he sat at the same table with them, fellowshiped with them, and he was one of them, even though he's one of God's children. He couldn't stand for the Lord. He had already sat in the seat of the scornful. So Christians, we're in the same position. Psalm number one. Watch it now. I'm going to read it, what I just preached. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, because here's what happens. They won't let you stand. They'll make you sit down with them. Nor, st nor standeth in the way of sinners. Oh, now the godly walk's gone. Now just stand there. 
Stop moving forward. And eventually it says, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. That is the progression of a life of a sinner. They walk away from God. They begin to, to enjoy the company of sinners. And eventually they sit in the seat of scornful and Christians. You and I cannot stand for God if that progresses in our life. That's the reality of it. All right. So look at this. Uh, our stance is important. Amen. Our stance is important. Now, and I, I want to hit this point again. If you are walking with God at any point, the Lord calls on you. You will naturally stand for the Lord. You, you're designed that way. That's God's program for us. We always think, oh, I got to be in the spirit. I got to be prayed up. I got to be. No, the reality is you just have to be walking with the Lord. And when the devil comes, you're already ready. And we'll get to Ephesians 6 here in a minute. All right, so the stance. Number one, what was the number one point? A solid, stable footing. Amen. So a place where we can stand strong or with a good stance. Number two, not crossed up in unbelief. Amen. Not standing still with our feet together, not walking in obedience but rather walking forward with the Lord so that when He calls on us, we can already be standing for Him. It seems very natural. It should not have to be, oh man, I should really say so. It should just come out naturally because you're walking with God where we can stand for the Lord. All right, 1 Corinthians 16, 13. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. So here's what Paul tells the Christians... He said, watch ye and stand fast in the faith. So you've got to be in the faith. You've got to be walking with the Lord. Quit you like men. And we know what that means. It means don't quit. It means fight to the death. Amen. You can't fight as you're sitting down in the sea of the scornful. And then it says, be strong. Be strong. Point number three. Be strong in the grace of God and His Word. Be strong in His strength. Be strong in Him. 2 Timothy chapter 2 here for a moment. 2 Timothy chapter 2. So it's not enough just to have the right solid footing on stable, solid ground, the rock. It's not just enough to have the right stance. But look, at you know something else you need? You need strength. Because the devil doesn't just fight you for a little bit. The devil doesn't just fight you once. He's going to fight you again. So the more active we are with the Lord, the longer that we can, you know, put up a good fight. Amen. So lastly, our strength. Second Timothy chapter one or chapter two. And of course, Paul here, this is his last epistle, guys. So what's he saying? Verse one. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So. The idea here is our strength is in the Lord. 1 John chapter 2, verse 14. Watch this. 1 John 2, 14. So if we're going to stand, and I, I will say this, I don't like contention, but I do like defending the Lord. We call it apologetics. I am not ashamed to talk to people at work about the Lord. In fact, I love it. I used to be so scared. Now, I know my God lives. Amen. I'm not just repeating something out of somebody else's mouth that I've heard. I believe Jesus Christ went into the grave, died on Calvary, went in the grave, and rose again. I believe that 185%. It's not a doubt in my mind. I don't care. I'll defend that to the day I die because I believe it with all of my heart. Amen. I believe that the Word of God is absolutely perfect and without error. I've studied it. I went to college for almost four years. I believe this King James Bible to be the absolute perfect Word of God. I'm, I'm absolutely 185% sure of that too. I believe Jesus Christ is coming again. And we should be looking forward to meet Him. And those without Christ will, in fact, die and go to hell. I'm not ashamed to say that. And we shouldn't be ashamed to say these things. We should believe it with a full a steadfastness. And, um, you know, as we look at this, it says in 1 John 2.14, and here's the great thing about reading God's Word. The things that we've heard from others, because the reality of it is we can't preach every single word from the Word of God. It would take us about 20 years to preach the entire Bible. And it might happen. I've preached through seven books since I've been here, but it's going to take a long time. I'm sure that I'm not going to go through every chapter in the book of Numbers with you and Ezekiel, and Jeremiah, and Lamentations. But 
When something is preached, that gives us faith. But when we read it in our Bibles, we say, oh, dear God, I believe it 100% because it's in your word. And I'm willing to defend it because I believe it with all my heart. And, and the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if we're to stand fast in the faith, the more we read of this, the more it gets into here. And the stronger we are as Christians in defending the faith. Sometimes we say, well, why, why are we weak? Well, how much are we spending in this book and actually... The more we spend in this book, the more we'll trust God, the more we'll believe God, the more we'll be able to stand for God. First John 2.14 says that. Watch. I've written unto you, fathers, because you've known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abideth in you and you have overcome the wicked one. So spiritual warfare is real. Victory is real. And we are to have strength in God, His Word. And according to this, the Bible says, the more of God's Word that abides in us, the stronger we are to stand. So if we don't take heed to it, don't obey it, then God's Word won't abide in us and we won't be able to stand and be strong. Ephesians 6.10, and we'll close here. Ephesians 6.10, again, if we want to take a stand for the Lord, we want to be on solid, stable ground, the rock of Him and His Word. Our stance needs to be right, not crossed up in unbelief, not feet together as we're not walking with Him, but walking with the Lord. So when He calls on us, we'll already be in that position where He can use us to fight the devil. And then we need strength, amen? Not just stand and say, well, that's it. It's, you know, my little, small little stand. By the way, you're going to find sometimes when you make a stand for the Lord, the battle just begins. It's not like, that is the only time sometimes when God calls you to stand. Sometimes God calls you to stand. And I, I, I'm going to say this as carefully as I can. I've seen a lot of Christians who began a fight and in the end compromised. And I believe that God wanted to do more with them. The homeschool fight, I believe Christians compromised on that. Um, the uh, church state issue, I believe Christians have compromised on that. And I believe a lot of these so-called Christian lawyers have taught us to not just defend the faith, which is right to do, but we're to be offensive as believers. We are to storm the gates of hell and tell them this is what the Bible says concerning this matter. We will not compromise on this matter. But most Christians have said, well, we'll compromise and we'll, we'll, t we'll allow you to tell us what to do in these areas of the church. We'll allow you to tell us what to do in these areas of the family. We'll allow you to tell us what to do in these areas of of the home, and they've compromised. And uh, we don't need to do that. And I, I've seen many examples of it. And time does not allow us to handle all of it tonight. But Ephesians chapter 6, and verse number 10. Ephesians chapter 6, and verse number 10. The Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of this darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand. And in the evil and having done all, excuse me, and in the evil day and having done all to stand. That's the second time he tells us. Verse 14, third time. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. You see there, we have to be doers of the word, just like what we've been learning tonight. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Remember, the more God's word we read, the more faith we have, right? Wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And I do believe the Bible says all there, doesn't it? And take the helmet of salvation. And let's just stop there for a minute. If there's something that's getting through to your mind and your heart, it's because you're not in a position, uh, Christian, where God can protect you because you're not taking all those steps to prepare yourself for the war that's in hand. It's a real war, too. Be sober, be vigilant, because what? Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh, walketh, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And take, the Bible says, verse 17, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication of the Spirit and watching thereunto with what? All perseverance. 
all perseverance. You need to be strong. Amen. You need to have endurance and you got to have strength to have endurance. All right. So let's pray here tonight. God help us to stand. Amen.